Good afternoon, everyone. Um, friends, alumni, students, and colleagues, and, and welcome to this uh, really stellar uh, Mason Science Series event, and stellar really this time, because we're actually going to talk about stars. <laughs> um, my name is Fernando Morales Wilhelm, and it's my privilege and my honor to serve as Dean of the Mason College of Science. Uh, this is our third Mason Science Series in 2021. Uh, and the last event for this semester. Uh, we're currently making plans for the series uh, in the fall and hoping for in-person events. Uh, you know, having uh, recently received my, my second uh, COVID vaccine, I must say that I, 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 found, I, found, I found it really uh, liberating. It's exciting uh, to imagine this fall uh, with faculty, uh, students and staff uh, on campus with these events happening uh, on campus and and of course, you know, all of this is contingent upon, um, you know, CDC guidelines and state um, um, uh, guidelines on, on, um, on return to campus, but we're really excited, lo really looking forward and working very hard and diligently towards uh, making an in-person fall of 2021 a reality. Um, you know, as, as uh, many of my colleagues, uh, and, and perhaps some of you have heard me uh, say before, uh, you know, I, I think uh, over the past year, the world has really had a front seat row, um, front row seat to to science, um, um, and um, and our Mason science community has really risen to to the occasion on many fronts, uh, forming um, uh, you know collaborations and, and nationally, uh, globally, uh, uh, you know developing um, you know new and innovative tests uh, uh, for COVID, uh, participating in teams that developed uh, you know uh, uh, the vaccines. Um, and uh, it, it's been it's been uh, it's been a really remarkable uh, year uh, to to see the impact that science can have on our daily lives. And I and I think, I mean, that's going to be one of the legacies of of this past year of this pandemic. Um, I think you know one of the advantages of of uh, of being affiliated with Mason. You know, we are a research one university. Uh, we've you know we have very prominent uh, biosciences and public health programs. It's it's um it's actually the ability to have our medically uh, trained staff working on campus. Uh, you know, if you if you were to drive through the uh, Eagle Bank Arena uh, Vaccine Center recently, you you would see an operation that it's it's it actually it 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 actually it's 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 outstanding. It, it's it's all inspiring um, because we've been we've been able to put together a very sophisticated uh, uh, you know end to end. Uh, vaccination operation and, and testing operation in, in a very short period of time. It makes me really proud of, uh, of, of the Mason community and, and, and all that we have achieved. Um, and it makes me wonder what else could achieve when, when pushed. And I think it's, it, you know, it's, it's quite, you know, quite a bit. Um, you know, it's, uh, and so th it's with a lot of pride uh, that, I, that I say that, you know, our, our scientists at Mason have, are, are, are continuing to make Significant contributions to uh, to society and and today it's a, it's an example. I I, I mean I, I want to uh, talk about a little bit about our, our speaker today because she's really one of these rock stars of science that that we have at Mason. Uh, before doing so, however, I, I just want to do some sort of Zoom quote unquote housekeeping uh, comments. Um, uh, we are recording uh, this event uh, and the link will be shared and posted on our website afterwards. Uh, um, if you have any questions, uh, those can be submitted uh, either using your name or, or anonymously uh, uh, at any time uh, uh, using the Q&A box uh, that's actually in the, uh, in, in the lower part of your Zoom screen. There's a Q&A, uh, and that's where you could, you could do that. Um, and, and certainly, um, we, will, we will be following up and, and, and answering questions uh, right after the presentation. Uh, I, I ask that all uh, microphones, cameras uh, are disabled uh, uh, for the event, um, uh, just so uh, we, we can have continuity and, and avoid any issues. Um, and, and with that with that said, I, I want to um, briefly introduce our, our distinguished speaker for this afternoon, uh, Dr. Shobita Satyapal. Um, and uh, she just, she's just joining us. And uh, uh, Dr. Sadia Pal is a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy um, uh, here at Mason. Uh, before joining Mason, she was a postdoctoral researcher at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center um, and an instrument specialist uh, 
for the James Webb Space Telescope at, at Goddard um, and the Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, her research, which she'll talk to you a little bit about today, uh, focuses on understanding the connection between the growth and evolution of supermassive black holes and the host galaxies, galaxies in which they reside. So when I said that we that we're gonna have we were gonna have a stellar presentation, I was actually not doing justice to um, uh, to the topic. And uh, I've seen Shobita in action, and it's really really impressive. Um, uh, she's not only an outstanding scientist; she is a favorite professor with our students. Um, uh, she um, goes out of her way uh, to teach um, undergraduates, upper level, uh, lower level. Uh, She's uh, taught physics for non-science majors. She's taught astrophysics for upper under level undergraduates and graduate students. I mean, she covers the whole ground of, of our teaching in addition to her outstanding job as a scientist and researcher. Um, but interestingly also, um, she's one of these uh, you know, Renaissance individuals. Um, she attended art school in France before entering grad school in physics. Uh, and, and art remains a passion of hers. And, and um, you know, for some of the students that are joining, uh, you know that she's also passionate about her uh, golden retriever um, and uh, who sometimes joins her on her Zoom lectures. And I, I, and I think uh, there's a, I, I've seen a couple of pictures and it's incredibly hilarious. So um, maybe he, this, the golden retriever may, will make an appearance this afternoon, who knows? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with that. It, it is my, my privilege and, pres and, pl and pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Shobita Satyapal. Welcome, Shobita. Hi, Fernando. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and for the opportunity to speak to you today about something that's really dear to my heart, which is uh, supermassive black holes that reside in the hearts of galaxies. So um, as Fernando mentioned about uh, Zoom and my dog Yuki, uh, he, he enjoys Zoom. <laughs> and I know that uh, many of you have Zoom fatigue right now, which is uh, really a thing. And so I especially want to thank you for joining me today to take this little break and to think about uh, you know, some of these big questions that we have as humans on this planet regarding uh, the universe. And I should just tell you that a colleague of mine was telling me that uh, she typically spends five hours on Zoom per day. And if you do the math, and you've been doing that for 370 days or so by now, that works out to be 1,850 hours or 110 a uh, thousand minutes or 77 days. So thank you for joining me on your 1,850th hour on Zoom or whatever the case may be. So let me uh, share my screen here. Um, Okay, is that working? <laughs> Perfect. Okay, good. I, I always have to worry which screen is sharing with two monitor situation. Okay, so uh, before I begin, I, I wanted to uh, tell you something that I told my class recently. And that is that everyone has felt stuck, right? For the past year or so sitting in your room with the same four walls, uh, sitting in front of your computer in a Zoom. And so what I told my class is that right here, right now, everything in your room, every creature, everybody on this planet that we call Earth is moving, actually. The sun and the Earth, and again, everything in, the, in your room, in my room, is moving about the center of the Milky Way, which is 26,000 light years away, or one followed by 17 zeros miles 
away. And we are moving fast. How fast? 125 miles per second. And we've done this about 19 times since the origin of the Milky Way. Not only are we moving about the center of the Milky Way, but the Milky Way and the sun and all of the hundreds of billions of stars in this galaxy that you see here, the schematic, <laughs> is moving with respect to the large scale structure of the universe. How fast? 230 miles per second. I could get to New York City, which is where I'm from, and I miss very much <laughs> in one second at that speed. And that means, just so you know, that since this pandemic began, you have actually traveled over 7.5 billion miles just in the time in which this pandemic began. In fact, um, that is twice the distance that Pluto is from the sun. So while you feel <laughs> that you have been stuck this past year, we actually are moving at tremendous speeds through this entire universe. And in actually a typical human lifetime, let's say a little over 80 years, you would have traversed one trillion miles through the depths of the deep void of intergalactic space. So wherever you were as a child in the universe, you are, you know, um, billions of miles from where you were at that point in time. So um, just to give you some perspective, when you feel like you're going crazy and you're sitting in your room, staring at the four walls, the same four walls, uh, just have a little bit of cosmic perspective as I tell my class, go outside, look at the sky and remember, um, remember uh, that we, we're part of something much bigger. So, um, now, before I begin to tell you about supermassive black holes that reside in the centers of galaxies, I like to begin with a very famous image that I show here. And uh, most people that I ask and I show them this image, it's a familiar image. It's an image of uh, the Hubble Deep Field. And what it represents is a tiny sliver of the sky. So if you take a dime, and you hold it at arm's length, that tiny little sliver of sky, roughly one-tenth the diameter of the full moon, if you take that little patch of sky and you stare at it with the Hubble Space Telescope for 11 continuous days, which is about 400 orbits, this is what you see. It is the deepest view of the universe. And in that tiny patch of sky, are 10,000 galaxies. So every one of these little dots represents a galaxy, each one uh, with hundreds, uh, hundreds of billions of stars in it, each one extending several hundred thousand light years across space. Um, these represent, as I said, the deepest view of the universe. A um, hundred trillion trillion times fainter than what the human eye can see. Many of these galaxies are so distant. And remember that when you look at any one of these points of light, because it takes light a finite amount of time to travel to your eye, you are actually looking into the past. And when you look at the faintest objects here, these represent galaxies when the universe was only a few hundred million years old out of its 300, sorry, 13.2 giga year history. So this image that you see here represents um, about 13 billion years of cosmic history, which is a pretty amazing thing. And so, um, 
I like to point out to people just, you know, just to put things in perspective that it's really been only human, you know, one human lifetime when we even knew there were any other galaxies in the universe. And now what we know is that there, there are as many as one trillion galaxies in the universe today. Um, so the amount of progress in this field is really mind blowing. Uh, again, it's really only one human lifetime essentially where we have been able to realize that there were galaxies outside of our own. And yet fundamental questions still remain unanswered. How did these things form? You know, why are they as big as they are? Why aren't they, you know, a million times bigger or a million times smaller? How and why did they evolve into the structures that we see today? What is their ultimate fate? And of course, what lies at the centers of these massive uh, structures in the universe? So, um, so before I begin my story about supermassive black holes in the hearts of galaxies, I want to tell you about what resides in the center of our, our own galaxy. And so this is a schematic of the Milky Way galaxy, as I talked about before. We are sitting right here relative to the center of the Milky Way, 26,000 light years from the center. And this is roughly 100,000 light years in extent. And there are anywhere from 200 to 400 billion stars in this pancake shaped disk of the galaxy. Um, and you have probably heard that that's just the visible part of the galaxy and actually 90% of the matter in the Milky Way is currently in some unknown dark form. So 90% is in dark matter. And uh, for a long time, it was completely a mystery what lies at the center of the galaxy. And of course, one would think that, you know, the galaxy in which we reside is the easy one, easiest one to study. Um, and one would think, you know, we would have learned what was at the center of the Milky Way a long time ago. The problem is, however, that if you're sitting here in the plane of the Milky Way, there's a lot of material between you and the center of the galaxy. And it turns out that the universe is really dusty, it's not just your house, but there's small particles in interstellar space that actually uh, block the uh, light emitted at visible wavelengths from reaching your detector on Earth. In fact, um, believe it or not, that only one in 1.5 billion photons emitted from the center of the galaxy actually makes it to telescopes on Earth. And for this reason, for a long time, the center of the Milky Way has remained a real mystery. Um, and you can see here in this image, uh, on the top, you have an image taken in the visible part of the spectrum in, in red light. And this is the plane of the Milky Way where the center of the galaxy is somewhere over here. And what you can see is just, uh, it's completely blacked out. And that's not because there's nothing there. It's because the uh, interstellar dust is preventing the light or blocking the light from the center of the galaxy uh, from getting to your eyes or your detector. And uh, you can see that nicely here. If you go to longer wavelengths of radiation, namely the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which you see here, suddenly, the center of the Milky Way lights up. And uh, the, these over here are just uh, different wavelengths in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So um, unfortunately, it's been challenging to do infrared astronomy um, because of the atmosphere, uh, which absorbs a lot of the radiation. But on the peaks of mountaintops in the past 25 years, astronomers were able to use infrared radiation and peer towards the center of the Milky Way. And what they saw was amazing. I'm gonna take you through this little movie. Into the center of the Milky Way. And we're zooming in 
to higher and higher spatial scales. And so far it looks normal, looks similar to what we find in our solar neighborhood. But as you get closer and closer, zooming into the center of the Milky Way, what you see is amazing. First of all, you see thousands of stars. In fact, in the space between our sun and the next star, you have 10 million stars. Massive, unusual stars. So this is an um, infrared image. I'm lapsed showing the motion of the stars now in three dimensions. And this is taken uh, from the Max Planck Institute and also from Euphia from Andrea Getz, recently won the Nobel Prize for this outstanding work. And what this shows is that if you study the orbits of the stars at the center of the Milky Way, what you find is that the stars are moving really, really fast. How fast? 10 million miles per second, sorry, per hour. And if you do the math, you can calculate how much mass is enclosed in the orbit. You can see there's nothing there. It's just going around what appears to be nothing. And if you do the math, you find that the, the mass of that central invisible object is four million times the mass of the sun. And that was really uh, irrefutable evidence for a supermassive black hole. And of course it won uh, the Nobel Prize um, uh, last year for this amazing work. So um, that really revolutionized the field. People asked uh, so many different questions. You know, how did this supermassive black hole form? Uh, we really still have no idea. Uh, what is it doing there? What is its ultimate fate? Is this common? Do other galaxies have supermassive black holes? Um, and these were just the questions that have plagued uh, astronomers for the past uh, couple of decades. And it turns out that uh, the Milky Way is not alone in having a supermassive black hole. And you might have heard about the results uh, from the galaxy M87, in which uh, an image of the black hole's uh, shadow was first uh, taken. And so um, I'm just going to show you a quick movie of what lies between the Virgo and Leo constellations. Galaxy M87, which was recently imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope. An amazing technical marvel, which enabled us to zoom in closer and closer to M87, and closer and closer to the center. See this amazing jet structure go on higher and higher resolution, you finally see the black hole shadow, uh, which is a prediction from general rel relativity as the photons are whipped around the event horizon of the black hole. And the size of the shadow is exactly as predicted by general relativity. Uh, again, you know, an amazing accomplishment um, and triumph for general relativity and Einstein. And uh, it also showed these amazing jet-like structures that uh, can extend 1 million light years in the intergalactic medium. And they can contain as much energy as 20 billion supernova exploding at once. And uh, just to give you a sense for the technical marvel, uh, this was a worldwide effort uh, with 200 members, uh, 60 institutions, over 20 countries, in order to simulate a telescope as large as the Earth, which is necessary to get the very high angular resolution that you need to image the black hole. And, uh, uh, and this is just a, an image just showing you all the different locations 
uh, for these telescopes uh, where atomic clocks are used to time tag the data to extreme position, precision to one tenth of a nanosecond. And uh, the data, data is actually hauled on 747s uh, because there's a whole lot of data and you actually don't have the bandwidth um, to transfer the data in any other way where it's brought to the correlator site and analyzed, uh, providing extreme resolution. Uh, actually, uh, just to give you an idea, the resolution is equivalent to holding an atom at arm's length. Um, and uh, also holding up a dime in New York City and having someone read it in LA. So it's incredible uh, angular spatial resolution that was enabled through this huge collaborative effect. And uh, it turns out that it's not just the Milky Way and it's not just M87 that has a black hole, but in recent years, astronomers have looked at galaxies uh, in the nearby universe and even in the distant universe. And this is just a 3D image, uh, an actual image uh, taken from the Sloan Digital S Sky Survey. And it's reconstructed as a movie just showing what the real universe looks like. Every one of these things is a galaxy. And when you look at the center, you actually find evidence for supermassive black holes in every one of these galaxies. So we know, now know that supermassive black holes are a fundamental component of galaxies, the galaxies in which they reside. And that leads uh, to uh, you know, really revolutionize the field. And what more is that the, the supermassive black hole doesn't just sit at the center of the galaxy, but it has a profound effect on the galaxy in which it resides. We now know that the mass of the galaxy or how big a galaxy is, is related to how big the black hole is, suggesting that there's some type of intimate relationship between the black hole and the galaxy in which it resides. Is the black hole somehow necessary for galaxies to grow? It's sort of a chicken or egg problem. And we realize that the black hole doesn't just sit there, but as I said, it has a profound impact on the host galaxy. And this is a, an image of a galaxy called Centaurus A, nearby galaxy that has a supermassive black hole. And what you can see is that it has amazing outflows and jets uh, emanating from the central regions. And uh, these, these outflows, this material is actually being ejected at 10,000 miles per second. And the amount of material that can be ejected uh, as a result of this black hole can actually exceed the entire mass of the galaxy itself. And most people don't realize that the amount of matter outside of galaxies can actually be as much as the matter inside of galaxies. So uh, supermassive black holes are thought to eject this material and uh, prevent stars from forming. So they have a very, very critical role in shaping the evolution of the galaxy in which it resides. We also know that um, galaxies interact with each other. And I should just show you this one image because uh, it's incredibly impressive of uh, these extragalactic uh, jets that emanate from the central supermassive black hole at relativistic speeds well outside the size of galaxies. The supermassive black holes have a tremendous effect in the universe. And we now know that when uh, galaxies collide, and they do collide, in fact, um, galaxy collisions are common, um, the black holes in the centers will actually merge. In fact, uh, you've probably heard that LIGO detected uh, the first black hole collision in September of 2015. And this is a simulation showing what happened. So here, each of the black holes is about 30 times the mass of the sun. They were orbiting each other and you can see a spiral closer and closer, flinging out stars and gas until they get close enough 
to emit what's called gravitational waves or ripples in space time, draining their energy, leading ultimately to their collision. So, bam, this amazing collision took place, propagated through space, and 1.3 billion years later arrived at Earth. Um, where we were able to detect them. And we heard this, and that was an amazing field. And as you know, that that also uh, won the Nobel Prize for the first detection of gravitational waves. Um, and now we, we've, we've detected many more black hole collisions. Um, so I will just skip over. This is just uh, showing what happens, a sort of an exaggerated version of the stretching and squeezing of space and how the LIGO detectors um, were able to measure this, um, this uh, stretching and squeezing in order to uh, confirm the um, merging of black holes. So I wanna switch now to talking about what are the big questions our group has been uh, asking. So the first is, um, as I said, we now know there's irrefutable evidence that supermassive black holes exist. They don't just exist in our Milky Way, but they exist in the centers of almost every galaxy that we've looked at. Some of them reside in galaxies that are really distant and distant quasars when the universe was only a hundred, a few hundred million years old. And, um, but we don't yet know how they form. How do they grow to such tremendous sizes? These are still outstanding questions that our group and a number of others have been trying to answer. And um, I'm going to uh, talk about one uh, of the research areas in today's talk. And uh, that is the question of how supermassive black holes grow to such tremendous sizes. Now, it turns out that in order to answer that question, searching for black holes in galaxy mergers seems to hold the key. We now know that galaxies are likely to collide with other galaxies. They're very common. In fact, most galaxies have gone through about one to three collisions over cosmic time. In fact, our Milky Way is going to collide with the Andromeda galaxy, which is approaching us at 68 miles per second. Um, but don't worry, because this coll collision will happen in 4.5 billion years from now. So long after the sun will evolve off uh, and turn into a red giant um, and, and the earth will get too hot for life to exist. So that'll be around you know, 3.75 billion years from now. And uh, what I show here is just a movie simulating what happens when two galaxies collide. And what you can see is that as the galaxies collide, material is funneled towards the center of the galaxy, the, the potential well, as we say, um, where they can fuel the, whatever black hole resides at the center. And so we think that um, when, when these collisions happen, that's when the black hole is feeding its most and, and growing as a result. And when it's in this stage, it's called uh, an active galactic nuclei. So our group has been searching for these feeding or growing black holes in the center of galaxies. Um, so as I said, these mergers are common and it's the best explanation for supermassive black holes. And so we have been studying uh, galaxy mergers, uh, trying to hunt for AGNs or active galactic nuclei or feeding black holes in the centers of galaxies. So let me just tell you what's been done before. Um, most of the work has been carried out in the optical part of the spectrum or visible part of the spectrum. Now, the problem is um, that in order to find these, uh, you need the, the actual material that's falling on the black hole is actually also hiding it from visible light. And furthermore, the gal even though you know, mergers are common, 
Um, the AGNs in the mergers have been rare, rare uh, contrary to predictions. And two black holes identified through AGNs are even more rare. In fact, there are only 30 known in the universe. So um, in fact, using a, a robotic telescope called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey shown, shown here, only 1% of the 1 trillion galaxies in the universe uh, were found to show signs of AGNs and only 2% uh, were, were found uh, to show dual AGNs. So, um, so as I said before, the limitations of the previous work uh, are that the infalling material actually obscures the visible photons from getting to us. And so you can actually see the AGN in optical light. In fact, that's the very same reason why you couldn't see what was sitting in the center of our Milky Way. So we realized that, hey, you know, these aren't actually rare because they are rare, calling into question, you know, uh, our current paradigm for um, uh, galaxy evolution, but we're just looking at it with the wrong set of eyes. And so our group has been conducting an X-ray and infrared investigation of the centers of galaxies in order to search for these active galactic nuclei. So um, we want to find them, we want to measure their masses, we want to see how much they're growing, and we want to study how they are affecting the host galaxy in which they reside. And we've been using a slew of space-based telescopes, and I'm just going to show you here WISE, the Chandra Space Observatory, New Star. Uh, these are all uh, NASA grade observatories, and we're using some ground-based observatories, Keck, and the Large Binocular Telescope. And uh, I should tell you that it's been uh, a really amazing journey. I'm so grateful. We spend hours writing proposals. I remember my first proposal was in 2012 to do this project, and we asked to observe this set of 15 galaxy mergers, hoping to find signs of AGNs or feeding black holes lurking in their centers. But people didn't believe us. They said, no, we've looked in the optical, they don't exist. And I remember I had pneumonia and I was working so hard. And I said, no, it's that the light is blocked. We have to look in the X-ray or the infrared. And finally, after hours and hours of work, we convinced uh, the panel that, uh, yes, let's give them a shot, let's let them try, and lo and behold, what we found was amazing. So when every one of these galaxy mergers, the center of the galaxy lit up with an X-ray point source, uh, direct proof of a feeding black hole. And what we noticed is that in the center of the galaxy, not only did we find one accreting black hole or AGN feeding black hole, but eight of them actually had two feeding black holes. These are the precursors for the galaxy collision, sorry, the black hole mergers that are going to give rise to the loudest gravitational events in the universe. And uh, what's more is that, um, yes, this was really exciting stuff. We got press releases uh, on finding, in fact, we doubled the known uh, population of dual AGNs in the universe. And so we were very happy. And we finally convinced the astronomical com community that maybe these really aren't rare. We just have been looking at it with the wrong set of tools. Um, we increased the number of known AGNs in these merging galaxy pairs by 40%. They might actually write be there, but we've just been blind to them. And what's more is that right around that time, a very bright grad student joined my group, which I highlight here, Ryan Fifely, and he very astutely and carefully looked at one of these images and noticed that one of them actually has three uh, X-ray point sources, suggesting three supermassive feeding black holes or a triple black hole, which was an incredible finding is the only one known in the universe at these uh, separations. And in a flurry of activity, we called our collaborators, Barry Rothberg, uh, who got us 
uh, data from the Large Binocular Telescope, our collaborators in California, and a number of grad students, uh, my grad student Jenna Khan. We worked really hard and uh, and we not only detected the first triple black hole, a uh, uh, feeding black hole in the universe, it's one billion light years away, uh, each one with 500 million suns. Uh, we also found that they're ejecting material at tremendous speeds, 1500 miles per second. And uh, together we quickly published this result in 2019 and the Astrophysical Journal uh, got another press release and, uh, and had a lot of fun with um, press coverage ranging from the New York Times, CNN, and a, a lot of interesting stories there that my graduate student Ryan would be happy to share from you. And why is this important? Um, it's the only triple confirmed in the universe and it might provide a clue to an outstanding question, which is, uh, how do you get black holes to finally actually merge or come close enough where gravitational waves uh, can uh, result in a loss of angular momentum and energy and cause the collision? Uh, and this will actually give rise to the loudest gravitational events in the universe, just to give you an idea that in the last uh, final milliseconds of the 2015 gravitational wave detection, um, the, the entire power radiated in gravitational waves was equivalent to 50 times all of the energy in all of the stars in the observable universe. And these supermassive black holes, when they collide, will actually give rise to, uh, to energies uh, a million times greater. So these are colossal events in store. So this is the Zoom wake up time. wondering why I showed this video apart from waking you up at this point in Zoom. And this is because astronomers really need large telescopes. So our observing program is at its limits. And this is because in order to find black hole collisions in the more distant universe emitting infrared and x-ray radiation, so uh, these dual AGNs, we need bigger telescopes. And the reason for this is because, and I like to tell my students that uh, if you go out on a moonless night and you try to see anything, you see how hopeless it is. But an owl on a moonless night can see a mouse 300 feet away when we can't see anything. And the reason is, because of the larger collecting area of the pupil. And so uh, we are eagerly looking forward to the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a six meter, six and a half meter telescope that is uh, soon to be launched. And uh, we are excited that we actually got time uh, for this great observatory to look at some of the um, galaxies we wanna be looking at. And the lesson I can say that we've learned uh, and this is not just for astronomy, is that the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes, which I think is a lovely quote from Marcel Proust, which applies not just to telescopes, but uh, to this pandemic. So we are eagerly awaiting uh, the James Webb Space Telescope which involves uh, technical marvels that I was privileged enough to work on uh, while I was at NASA Goddard. And I'm really uh, grateful for being able to get observing time on this major observatory. And uh, I know the, long, the road has been long, <laughs> both for JWST and for this pandemic, 
but uh, I think in both cases, uh, the future looks bright. And so with that, I just wanna introduce my uh, research group. I've had a number of amazing students over the years. These are my current students um, that you see in uh, the following slide. Uh, Jenna Kan is uh, the most senior student and she is just starting a postdoc position at uh, NASA Goddard. Um, and we have uh, a whole slew of, of extremely talented uh, students and postdocs that I'm very grateful to work with. And a whole list of collaborators, too many to men mention on the slide, but I list uh, uh, the main collaborators for the project I talked about. And I wanted to say that I've been extremely grateful that life as an astrophysicist is really fun. Uh, as you can see, I have sent my students to all kinds of places. And this is Rachel. Uh, this is Jenna at, uh, at the Keck Observatory on Mauna Kea. This is Ryan enjoying a whale watching tour that we did back in the days when we used to travel. Uh, Lara giving a talk at the AAS meeting um, in, uh, in Honolulu. And you can see that uh, some of my collaborators have had a lot of fun on conferences <laughs> and go to dangerous places. This was on the Billy Goat Trail. Uh, and uh, this is us celebrating um, all of the, the great science that we've been able to do here at Mason's. So with that, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Shovita, for, um, for this fascinating uh, presentation uh, and, 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 and certainly for your dedication to, to your research and, and to and working with students. It's, it's really amazing um, uh, all that you have been doing. Um, uh, and um, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, 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 some, some questions. Uh, um, and uh, so I'll read it to you and I'll, I'll ask you to respond. Um, what is a white hole and how does it relate to black holes? Oh, wow, um, that's a really good question. Um, and I would say that I'm not the best person uh, to answer that. Um, I would say that uh, it's, it's more of a theoretical um, idea. Um, and... And yeah, uh, I mean, there are, there are a lot of different questions that um, I would say are, are, are still speculation or, or theoretical um, predictions uh, like wormholes, for example, as well. Okay, okay. Um, um, let me shift gears. Uh, I'm, I'm quite interested as, as to, uh, I mean, we heard from a little bit on your background that you, you know, went to, art school and you know and of course you're trained in physics but I'm curious as to how how you landed on 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 this specific field what got you interested what you know what made you say I want to I want to really study these black holes and and the revolution and simulate them and try to visualize them um well I I guess um originally I was interested in uh theoretical particle physics. Um, and then uh, when I went to graduate school, I realized that, um, you know, that, that a lot of the major advances I felt would be in astrophysics, just because, you know, technology would enable a lot of things that, uh, you know, weren't, weren't possible. And so I really uh, thought that, you know, now is the time to be a uh, an astrophysicist, um, because I felt that the, the, you know, that the advances in particle physics could be incremental <laughs> at the time. Um, so I, I switched um, to astrophysics. Um, and then uh, really supermassive black holes um, were really not a field. <laughs> Uh, until really I started doing research. Mm -hmm. So it, I think a lot of it is timing. And, and, and I also think that there's something fundamentally interesting about supermassive black holes or black holes in general. I think that, I think that we're always trying to find the answers to something that we can never know. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So that might be the human condition. Sure. Sure. And, and on the topic of, of, of supermassive black holes, how, how big can they get? There's a question in the chat. <laughs> um, so uh, there are actually, uh, you know, in principle, no limit. There, there are limits to how big a star can get. Um, but we don't really know if there's a limit to how big um, a supermassive black hole can get. Um, okay. Okay, um, what will eventually happen to black holes? So uh, eventually, um, black holes will evaporate through Hawking radiation, um, which many people have heard about. And so the ultimate fate is actually uh, nothing, nothingness. Um, so they'll eventually evaporate. Okay. Um... Another question is, when will the JWST start taking data? What's your estimate there? Um, so the JWST is going to be launched in October, the end of October this year. And then uh, we expect, uh, you know, it takes a while to get to orbit. And, uh, and we expect that, um, that data will first uh, start um, being taken in, in May of 2022. So we have a program approved, so we're really uh, looking forward to, to getting that data. So it'll be sometime next year. Good. Um, again, switching gears. Uh, so um, what would you, what would you advise be to a, a teenage age Shobita uh, out there who's now in middle school or high school and is interested, what, what will you tell yourself? What's, what, 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 would that, what would that look like? Well, I, I would say that, um, <laughs> big question. I would say that, uh, you know, doing a lot of physics and math because um, most people don't realize that um, most astrophysicists are physicists. In fact, um, to be honest, I didn't actually take astro astronomy courses. Um, my undergrad and grad courses were all in physics. So I would say, uh, you know, have a really strong math background and a physics background and never be afraid to ask questions and, uh, and always uh, be bold. I would say be bold and admit when you don't know something. Okay. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, those are all of our questions. So uh, I want to thank you again for, uh, for being with us this afternoon. And I want to thank also the audience for, uh, for uh, being there. I, um, I got an earlier question about making sure that we were recording uh, the presentation because they wanted to look at the fascinating videos you were showing. And, and I, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm, I'm certain that that will be um, something that people will go back to. It's, uh, it was really a beautiful set of videos that you showed. Uh, so thank you again, Shobita, for coming and, and thanks everyone um, uh, and for joining us in this extraordinary discussion. I, I hope that in the very uh, uh, near future, we can meet in person and celebrate science together again. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, and um, um, and it's been it's been our pleasure to uh, to have this be, um, you know, a uh, the you know the talk for the Mason Science Series for spring of 2021. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>